Thanks for joining everyone. I'm just just going to start in in one minute while we let a few while we let people into the room. Okay. Um, hi everyone, thanks for joining again uh, for this art school event. It's a special event this week in that we're coinciding with UAL's amazing graduate showcase, um, which is all happening online. Some of it also on YouTube um, along with this stream. Uh, and today we're very fortunate to have Chris Veit Wasilak, who um, is joining us to discuss Johanna Billings 2019 video and performance work in purple. Uh, Chris will be in conversation with uh, Graham Ellard here, who is an artist, filmmaker and professor at CSM. Uh, Chris is a writer and critic based in London, a regular contributor to Art Agenda, Camera Austria and Freeze. He's also a contributing editor of Art Review, uh, so you may well have seen all of his work in those publications. Um, he's just had a new book out, uh, The Artist in Time, which is published by Herbert Press. Um, oh, sorry, is that the one that you've just had out, Chris? Yes, that's Yeah, correct. that's right. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, and uh, Chris and Graham will be talking about um, various uh, very interesting issues, the right to space, the reclamation of space, um, ideas around self-teaching and this idea of purple washing, uh, which Chris will explain. Um, Chris and Graham will be talking for about half an hour, during which time please feel free to send us your questions through the chat. If you're watching on YouTube, you can also send your questions on the chat there and I'll pick them up. Um, and then either after that half hour uh, or during, if it seems particularly relevant, um, we will, uh, I will deliver those questions or you, if you would prefer, we can turn on your mic so that you can, can your voice at least can be in the room and part of the discussion. Um, I think that is all I have to say by way of introduction. So I'll just hand over to Graham now. Thanks. Thanks, Amber. Um, and um, uh, thanks to all the attendees. Um, I'm not going to say any more to add to what Amber has already said, but rather just uh, deftly pass the ball to Chris, um, uh, who I think is going to give us a very brief outline of the content of the essay, but also show a, a particularly uh, representative clip, about a one minute piece, I think, yeah. Chris, um, yeah. from uh, Johanna's film. Um, and then at some point through um, perhaps some prompts from me, we'll talk about the work in, in a bit more depth. Yeah, I just thought for those who haven't seen the film, rather than us kind of go on about it, assuming that everyone's on the same page, it'd be good to show a segment of it. And then um, I was just going to talk through some of the ideas in the essay, just so again, for people who haven't had a chance to read it, um, we at least have common ground that we can all kind of discuss from gone with. So I'm going to share my screen now just to play a sort of one minute sample from Billings in Purple.
And so that just gives you kind of the general flavor. I mean, the, the piece itself is 12 minutes long, just to summarize the piece quickly before I summarize the essay. It's just, um, it's a 12 minute looped video of the young women that you see there carrying the panes of glass to a basketball court, setting up the panes of glass, carrying out a choreographed um, dance routine and then dispersing again, and then it all starting all over again. But I think what you might've seen in the, the um, clip as well is just the sense of color, um, but also the fact that the camera is sort of a wandering eye that sort of looks you know, at the light through the trees, at um, the, per the birds passing by, you'll see the sort of playgrounds in the background and kind of people busing by. So that's sort of the general vibe of the whole thing. And that was kind of one of the things that sort of set me off was kind of thinking about the piece is that it's ostensibly focusing on this group of young women, but actually they only appear for about half of the screen time. So it was also this sense of like, well, what is it actually materially or visually about if it's, if they're, equally part of the environment in terms of screen time. Um, and then, I mean, also just to give you a sense, because there's some very heavy symbols there, I guess, in terms of glass um, being carried as this, this sort of sense of fragility um, and also just like literal reflection of their environment. Um, and, uh, and then there's a part of an earlier part where there's an older group and they approach a slightly younger group of young women, they hand over the glass to them. So there's also this kind of symbolic generational transition that goes on. And, and these kind of felt like bigger things that could be focused on. But I guess what I was sort of interested in underneath all that was the presentation and the use of public space um, and the different forms that it takes when it's there. You know, we, we see all the kind of pathways sitting in between the sort of monolithic, not too high um, apartment buildings. Um, and I mean, even though they have these sort of pastelish colors, they still have this sort of imposition to them that feels like the kind of ring fencing in the green space. Um, so we see these sports grounds. Later in the video, you see um, football grounds that have been all kind of torn up as well. Um, and then, yeah, so these different forms of public space. And I guess for me, an underlying thing to think about as well was just sort of um, this idea of uh, the suburb or, or a kind of like fringe situation of like where and how culture is a rise. And I guess this whole series is sort of framed pedagogically. Um, so it was also this idea of like, how do you learn? I mean, for me, it was a, like a basic thing, I guess, growing up in the suburbs, like, how do you actually hear about music in the first place to know what you like? And, and to me, that seems like a basic question here of like, they, they kind of know what they're into, and they're sort of claiming it, but at the same time, this that wondering, of yeah, where it comes from and where it goes, I suppose, from there. Um, so yeah, those are kind of wider questions I was interested in of like, how do you actually talk about culture in a fringe condition? I mean, partially because I think there's this idea that the suburbs and town edges are treated as if there is no culture. And I think we all know that there is culture there, but it just becomes a question of like, how do you, it, there's almost this sort of self-effacing quality to it that I think is interesting. Um, that like say, particularly when you're young, you kind of want to get out of somewhere. You want to disregard the fact that there's something where you are and you're always looking elsewhere. So it, it was that sort of dislocation I was kind of interested in as well. Um, so I guess the, the piece sort of started about thinking through some of these ideas of common spaces and um, play in public place. And, and, and I guess it has common commonalities with other Billings works of like staging an event and the camera as a sort of ambiguous um, sort of witness to something that is kind of between an event and a, you know, a sort of happening or, you know, we kind of get a music video for one minute as well. Um, but I guess it was sort of looking through sources about, you know, claiming public space or play, dance, these sort of things at all seem to fall through the cracks. I mean, there's a kind of casualness to the video that sort of belies what feels at stake, I guess. Um, and I think a turning point for me was just kind of using the colors then as a guiding point, I suppose, because there's a lot of, you might've seen a lot of little visual links that happen throughout the video, just in terms of their outfits and the colors of the glass, obviously, but then that linking with the buildings and then um, there's little sort of, you know, cues of like flowers and, um, nets and uh, other bits that kind of ties them to what they're passing by. Um, and that became, 
came a way to try and think about, okay, is it just about mirroring space? Are they just reflecting their environment or it's, can it be a way of commenting on it a bit more? Um, and a useful text for me was just looking at a, an anthology called uh, Prismatic Ecologies, which just had a series of authors thinking through approaches to environment and ecology and sort of interactions um, using color as a sort of thinking guide. And um, say for one example with the pink color was the writer Robert McCrewer talking about pink washing uh, as an issue. And then the eco-feminist writer and theorist Stacey Alimo taking on this idea of um, black violet um, as this idea of the invisible, I suppose, that she was talking about, say, in the ocean, the abyss section of the ocean being something that is almost culturally assumed to be empty. And I guess that had a resonance for me of thinking through some of these sort of suburb issues, like um, that the suburbs are sort of assumed to be empty. And, and uh, so it kind of standing for this sort of what's not visible, what's not humanly understandable, when actually there's something or a lot going on there. Um, I mean, Alimo refers to it as a sort of abyss of concern. Um, so that became a, a kind of prism to think about their own use of, of purple, basically, the sort of violet that they're using uh, in the video itself. And it, it seemed like this kind of ambiguous relationship of calling attention to their surroundings and not quite a sort of like, celebration of it or in, in you know going where we are is great because obviously it also seems you know the fact that they're outside doing this thing and dispersing again it just seems like a bit um yeah it's obviously temporary it's obviously they're just making do with what they have and so it, it seemed like maybe a way to reflect on the ambiguities i suppose so like say the history of the buildings themselves that they're surrounded by being concrete more sort of brutalist buildings uh, built in the 70s, I believe, that were then repainted in the 90s as an artist um, intervention, but then that kind of obvious whitewashing of something, you know, the sort of artists making something look, um, it was a way of dealing with the social issues in the area through the housing. Um, so I guess it was trying to think about, yeah, through reading about the thoughts on pink washing, whitewashing, how we could think about uh, purple washing, I guess. I mean, for me, it was also approaching this, um, again, through this pedagogical lens. I didn't maybe so want much want to write about the pedagogy in the piece so much as like write the text pedagogically to like provide a tool so that people could then take and use that themselves as well. So this idea of purple washing being this sort of like changeable tool that would reflect on these sort of things that were obviously meant to sort of math over problems, but that could be um, adjustable in any situation, I suppose. And so it was kind of just, again, it's just a short essay. So it was just a way to suggest, okay, here's something to maybe think about what you see in your own environments and as a way to sort of flag it up and that, and then maybe as a way to talk about, I think the thing about the, um, the dance troupe was this idea that they, I'm no. taking up space, but there isn't much written about the way they take up space. Okay, let's start. This is the launch of the Central St. Martins 2020. We had some crossover with the YouTube. My name is Jeremy Till, and I'm head of Central St. Martins. I'm very happy to welcome you Second. to the event. I don't know how which we I know we're all used to doing Tampa things. For Adina. Um, nope. Let me, I'm going to mute all of the. Um, Seems to have been solved. Yes, that's it. It was Jeremy Till, no less, but um, but still, we need to shut him up. Yeah. Uh, well, that, it's handy timing because I was approaching the end of my uh, monologuing anyway. So, um, uh, yeah. So it was just kind of finishing with this idea of having something to hand over, I suppose, and a way to talk about things that um, were sort of not properly addressed or, or I don't know, danced about, let's say. <laughs> um, so perhaps I'd not followed, but, but maybe to help me understand, Chris, do you mean that we could think then of, um, in this work, the, the purple washing, if you like, or the, the 
the panes of glass, those tinted panes of glass, become, if it's not too simplistic, a, a kind of um, proxy for a, a different way of looking at that space. Perhaps a different way of looking by those particularly young women who, who, who grew up there um, as the means to uh, uh, see it in a different way. Is, is that what you mean by purple washing? In some sense, yeah. I mean, I think there's, again, there's a, there's a nice sort of ambiguity about the handling of it that allows it to be used in multiple ways. Because I think partially, yes, there's that sense of like, you know, rose tinted glasses, like, yeah, if they yeah, yeah. looking through the purple glass, they could see something different about it. I think there's also the aspect that the dimensions of the glass themselves are suggestive of the architecture around them. So there's also this sense of a kind of opening out and exploding of space or the architecture that also would suggest a, a different use of that space. Yeah. Um, but then I guess I also meant it in the way that um, people might wear a certain color to sort of flag affinities or things like that. So it's almost like partially them flagging an affinity with the buildings, but also flagging up the fact that those buildings are that color and that color has a history that is designed to mask other histories. Okay, yes, yes. So yeah, there seem to me, um, I hadn't quite pinned it down in that sense, but it seemed, I guess in my head, there were several different uses of it potentially. Yeah. And the fact that apparently the pieces of glass match the size of the typical windows in the apartment building. Yeah, I mean, I think there was some subtext. Yeah. I, I, I'm kind of struck by the idea that somehow the women are dismantling it. That they're, that they're carrying away the parts of this building somehow. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's a there's a publication that accompanies the video that's free to download um, that has a more sort of explanatory text of the backgrounds of the making the work. And um, and I thought I would, you know, let that text do that work. But um, part of what he describes is the fact that they, the only space that they have to rehearse in is a basement and they share that space with a religious group as well. And so they just have this kind of purple cloth that they use to separate them. <laughs> um, and I think that, yeah, the window dimensions are taken from the space as well. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. There, yeah, there's, there are those connections to where they rehearse and, but then there seems to be a, yeah, a liberatory element as well that they're trying to get out of that. Sure. I mean, it doesn't seem like an ideal arrangement or even sort of recognition in some sense. No, no. And it's, and it seems somehow to be a, something one one learns about that context that the film itself is littered with, um, there's a kind of repeated motif of empty sports facilities. So there yeah. are basketball courts, there's a, play, a children's playground that's cordoned off because it's half fallen down. Um, the loop back point, so it begins or ends with um, an empty sports hall, I think, um, which is the building, um, which mixed dancers use as their rehearsal space, but it's in the basement. Um, oh, so right, yeah, I wasn't sure the connection with the, because I, I just saw a sort of literal connection between an indoor basketball space and an outdoor basketball space where they actually do the, the choreographed routine. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, it, it seemed such a curious kind of contrast though between the built and unused spaces, the empty spaces, of those facilities hmm. um, and yet if you like the action the real action was amongst a kind of um, loose knit voluntary group of, of young women who occupy a bit of the building that isn't intended for that use so there's something about design and there's something about use and that the two yeah. don't necessarily always align well i think that's the thing yeah and it's sort of pre planned housing estate like that as well this is idea of a kind of um planned activities but also sort of predetermined gendered activities as well yeah. in terms of yeah football and basketball yeah um being recognized as something that kids can do but act, dance or something like that not being something that's provided space for i guess mm -hmm. so then they're resorting to you know, hanging out in these spaces and using them in that way, or even just temporarily, I guess. I mean, but then most of the playgrounds we see are empty. Um, and most of the other 
people we see are just kind of walking along. There's a few kids hanging around in the background. I think we see at one point a few other um, kids sort of co-rehearsing while they're doing their dance routine as well, which um, kind of echoes things nicely. But again, it's just a moment, I suppose. For the most part, it feels kind of kind of like an early morning that it's sort of abandoned in some sense or that it's, you know, there's that suggestion that people aren't, won't be there or just aren't there yet in some yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, so, th so behind all of that is um, a, a big project that was undertaken over three years, apparently. And there's a lot of context, isn't there? There's a lot of subject matter, which, as you say, is it's outlined in that booklet from the Hollybush Gardens site, but, uh, which is very interesting. But I suppose for me, one of the questions is, to what extent does that content, that subject matter, um, what's its role in the film itself? So if, if um, there's a substantial history to the place, there's a, a history to the, to the activities of those young women. Mm. Um, none of that's explained in the film. Um, the film, in a sense, either takes that as a given or um, it expects or requires us to, to find that out through other means. I, I suppose my question is, what of the form of the film? What does, what does the way that that film has been made by Johanna, but I'm sure we, we ought to probably say in collaboration with the dancers, um, what, what does that do with that subject matter that the subject matter itself um, doesn't articulate, do you think? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, it felt important to kind of acknowledge that building was giving them a platform in some sense and that, yeah, that, that stance of the camera as a witness is deliberate as a sort of stepping back as well after having this. I mean, I think it was, for me, it's interesting because I think it did begin as a conversation or an invitation to do a public artwork. Yes. And it is a public artwork. It's just not a, you know, that's anything true. that's permanent or lasting. Or, or I mean, the video has its own life, I suppose. So it, um, it's quite interesting to think about that sense. But I suppose what I mentioned briefly before, this idea of what we're actually seeing in the video and, and the young women being only just, just under half of that, I suppose. And so what we're seeing then is manicured, you know, we're seeing someone mow the lawn, we're seeing empty sports grounds, and we're seeing, um, you know, trash facilities, we're seeing gardens. So, and we're seeing these buildings a lot of the time. So I think what, what sort of, even without reading the background, I think what the film is foregrounding is this sense of planning and this sense of urban space and, and this sense of um, also, you know, that the trees and the, the birds are equal occupants and are, they're also playing in this space, you know, that there's, there is a sort of parody in terms of the visual representation, I think, and, and because the dancers are moving in a certain way, we obviously notice them more, but it's almost like a kind of a red herring or a MacGuffin or something, you know, it's like they're the sort of excuse to look at all these other infrastructural and natural elements that have coalesced into this situation. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, because I felt, I, I kind of made a point of trying to look at the video on its own before looking at any of the histories. And I, it, it is, I mean, obviously these things do have an impact, but it's also how one situation might feel relevant to another, you know, I mean, I guess why I became interested in sort of the fringe condition stuff, because it's not just about brutalist social housing from a certain point, even though that does particularly impact that sense of history, but it's also about, um, yeah, those, those pre-planned spaces where the planning has kind of sucked the life out of it in some sense too. I mean, it, but it does seem very calm and vivacious as well. It's not like, you know, it's not like there's, there's a lightheartedness to it mm. as well, you know, and they, but then like they never, the only time you see them smiling is when one or two of them are dancing sort of thing. Otherwise it's quite yeah, yeah. Um, straight faced in some sense. Sure. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. No, it is, isn't it? I mean, that's one of the things that struck me um, 
and this is another aspect, he described it as a kind of wandering eye, that it's as if the actions are occurring and we are um, uh, um, we're noticing it, but we're noticing this activity as one of many minor or major activities going on in the space, whether it's whether it's mowing the lawn or putting out laundry or and as you say, almost as a kind of anomaly or as a um, uh, a detail uh, is this solemn little group of, of young women yeah. um, passing I, for me the moment where they pass the glass and they're all that eye contact and kind of nervous because that mm. stuff's heavy I guess and it could shatter us there was a real sense of a kind of interaction there which maybe begins to allow that um, those themes of a, a kind of micro community of interest that finds itself or forms itself in this otherwise potentially at best dull, at worst hostile environment. And, and also, the, and I'm sure this is inflected by the knowledge that the older women, older young women are, are, are actually the originators of the group and now they are as it were kind of passing on whole passing that on to a, a younger group um, but there did seem to be um, a kind of element of, of, of um, uh, enablement learning I'm not sure teaching is necessarily the operative word but a but a kind of no, but um, I think that's yeah the interesting thing that sense of how do you yeah, I guess for me that that sense of teaching or learning in a sort of fringe or suburban environment isn't about explicit stuff. It's about knowing that there's a possibility of something unless yeah, yeah. or know that that something even exists in the first place. So if you have a model of culture or creativity that enacts in a certain way that you're sympathetic to, then obviously that you know you can work with that. You know what I mean? So in some sense, it's it's a it's a gift maybe to these younger mm. people who are getting involved in that but then it also it's interesting because yeah that moment you're talking about is there's a lot of the focusing on their hands mm. and you kind of see them kind of trying to adjust their grip and that I mean within all that is yeah the, the sort of metaphorical struggle of like coming to terms with things mm. um, yeah. which I think is interesting because it's also again that tells the story as much as the backstory I guess of mm the fact that they are celebrated in their community but it also seems that no one actually celebrates them enough to support them <laughs> or you know it's that they don't have a permanent space to work they don't have funding they don't have any other support so it, it is completely self-run and it is completely uh, self-contained in some sense so i guess um yeah that that idea that and i mean we had one person was just asking about commenting more on the, the idea of the purple washing thing. And I think that kind of brings it up in a nice way, but because the idea of almost like them claiming the color as their own and not as the building. So it's like, okay, we've done this ourselves. And we, even if we feel a certain way because of this place, we can own it to the extent that we know we're teaching, recognizing their own agency, I guess. And so um, it, they can see the sort of fact that you know, even if they don't literally like the color, I guess, it's sort of like a way of claiming it and saying, okay, there's a lot of things about this, but we built this ourselves and we are of this, I suppose, and we're going to make it ours. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, it's funny. I, have, I feel ambivalent about the word the claiming almost, but it's still kind of, because it's through these little small gestures, it's through those adjustments of the hands, it's through them carrying things, it's through them dancing. And that's, that's not, it's like a, it is active. Um, but then it's also so tenuous, I guess, is what's interesting about it. Um, I'm just looking at the time. It's half six. Might this be a good time to see if there are some questions? Yeah, I don't know if I dealt with that comment um, enough, but we can kind of dwell on it more if we want to. Um, hi, sorry. <laughs> we, do, <laughs> um, we do have, we've got one question so far. Um, in the meantime, I um, just thank you so much for um, that conversation. 
uh, for the students in the room, I was just thinking it would be interesting to hear your reflections on that idea of the extent to which young people are valued or valorized and where and how that aligns with or fails to align with the support that is offered. Um, and also about those ideas you're talking about of reclamation through small gestures and whether it would be interesting to hear how those resonate with any of the students in the room. Um, we have a question from Sim Panessa. Sim, would you like me to turn on your microphone or should I just read the question? I, I think we saw that one, uh, Amber. And, and, oh, sorry. And Chris did. Oh, no, oh, I don't know if I... Of course, yeah. yeah but, but maybe Sim would like to say something to follow up on. Or, res yeah, respond, absolutely. Mm. Um, well, in that case, I mean, well, I think it's a continual thing, though. I mean, because, um, so I'm just trying to get a thread I, of what you were just I saying. I can throw you another question if you. <laughs> no, no, but I guess you were talking about this idea. Well, because yeah, partially what came through writing the essay was this idea of like looking at things and seeing um, the fact that yeah, there there isn't a narrative there for these people and they're obviously using, um, you know, space temporarily. So it's kind of like, okay, they don't have a space for what they do. It's not like there's a youth center that they're using or a community center that they're using. And so it becomes a way to, um, yeah, think about that the temporariness and we can say claiming, but again, it just dissipates, I suppose. And so the, the, the lack of infrastructure seem mirrored by a lack of discourse, I guess, in the sense of like, I think there are sociological studies that look at, you know, the issues of young women in urban spaces or in suburban spaces. But I think in terms of culture, it's basically this abyss that we're looking at. And it, it there's sort of a few resonances between that in terms of where, where that lack of attention is, I suppose. And so, yeah, the, the, the outdoorsness being one aspect of that, or, you know, and, and the loop of the video itself being another reflection of that, I suppose. And so, and then texts, yeah, not sort of highlighting that, I guess. I mean, it, it, I mean, I think even just today, I guess there was a, I think uh, a writer named Leslie Kern has just published a book called The Feminist City. And there was an excerpt that was published today that was talking about these issues of, yeah, the fact that like people have these alternative experiences of the city, but often for young women, the narrative is often that it's a dangerous place. You don't go outside, you know, these sorts of things of like how are you meant to claim space if the narratives for knowing about claiming space aren't there as well, I suppose. Let me just, sorry, look at this other. Um, we do, sorry, Sim had a, a response to that. We have a couple of other questions. The response was issues of transparency came up for me when watching this piece and its relationship with same mirror piece with, by Joan Jonas. We see them, the environment, the buildings, but always through glass apart from when they dance. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, sorry, did you, unless you want to- No, no, I just, if you that. wanted to comment as well. Um, we have an, uh, a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, could you talk more about the relationship you make with Tikun? Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that properly. I, you, you did it before. Um, preliminary materials for a theory of the young girl. Yeah, I guess that again seemed like a way to think about. Um, was, sorry, just maybe to reflect on the reflection bit as well, because yeah, that I think um, what Sim is bringing up is this idea of fragmentation almost, of this idea of like, and maybe metaphorically this idea of how you manufacture yourself amongst such a dispersed thing. I don't know. I mean, I think it's a good observation, um, but I don't know if I have anything more insightful to say about it in that sense. Um, in terms of the Tikkun stuff of the theory of the young girl, I guess to me, again, it was interesting to see how this idea of, of a young teenager, a young woman, again, is used almost as a cipher rather than person in themselves. Um, I mean, in the book, the, uh, the theory of the young girl is just used again as, as an ex almost as an excuse to kind of talk about the archetypes of um, capitalism. So it, it, it almost felt like kind of speaking through a stereotype or embodiment of somebody rather than speaking to them or with them in some sense. So again, it and it just seemed like a kind of 
commonly cited source for kind of starting in terms of discourse and and radical theory, I suppose, to sort of talk about um, young people's presence and things, but then it it actually is just more like a shadow presence, I guess, or almost more or more like a smoke screen in some sense. So I felt like I was just using it as an example of how of of again this sort of lack of discourse, I suppose. Um, I don't know if that clarifies it, but And just uh, to add one thing, it kind of chimes with a thought that I had, which I think runs through certainly those films by Johanna Billing that, that I can call to mind, which is a, a real attentiveness to the particularity of, of the subjects of the people. So I, I never really had during watching this film a sense in which I was, I was, I will, I was watching types. I was watching youth or I was watching young women in a suburban context or I, I was very aware of the fact that I was watching this cluster of different people um, uh, thinking well, I, that that figure of the as you've just been describing Chris um, the, uh, a, a, a kind of parallel being the way in which um, Ian Bourne some years ago wrote about the skateboarder, as someone who, who reads urban space in a, in a radically different way. But the figure of the skateboarder is a figure, really. It's not a kid that can do it, but sometimes falls off or, you know, they don't have a name. They're just, these, they're, they're youth, aren't they? In, 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 um, in purple, and I think in, in, certainly you don't love me yet, and certainly, uh, magical world, which is one of my favourite films, artist films that I can think of. Mm. There's a real um, sense of these being people, people that we're studying in their in their ordinariness and their perfectness and their imperfectness. Um, and I think that's carried through to the dance sequence, which is great, but it's 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 not MTV, and and and, and that. <laughs> makes me love it all the more. Well, I think that's it. Yeah, I mean, I agree. It has a commonality with their other works in terms of working with people to kind of towards a situation. I mean, I, I haven't seen Magical World, actually. Um, but then, yeah, other other ones were, I mean, maybe in some sense, like, You Don't Love Me Yet, maybe there's a sense that the song's already there. Mm. Um, or in others where there's a situation that shapes it. And, and this one definitely has a more open-ended feel in the sense of like, okay, how do we let them do what they want to do and maybe also portray some of the other aspects. So it, it, it does sound like the piece was more kind of co-directed in that sense and, and a sense of how um, they wanted to portray themselves, I guess, being the main pedagogical aspect of this, I suppose, wow. that they saw. And because I think that sense of attention to, to people and to momentary things, I think is what Billing brings to it in that sense of like, okay, the, it's not about treating people as archetypes. I mean, the, again, maybe the colors use ambiguously as a sort of semi-abstraction. You know, they're all wearing the same shade of pink and they're using the color again to highlight. So there's a, no, there's a slight disassociation that color brings, but again, she's focusing on hands, she's focusing on nails, she's focusing on faces. Mm -hmm. And then the context as well. So I, yeah, there there seems to be an attention to the people, I suppose. And so, um, yeah, which again, high to me highlights more that fact of, yeah, you can't generalize it, I suppose, in that sense. Maybe I don't know if that's useful to say, but I think um, that sort of ties in slightly with a question um, from Irene to Chris, which is, could you explain a bit? just more generally about your interest in pedagogy and the way in which the, the, the piece works pedagogically. You did just touch on that slightly, but. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess there's a few layers on it um, as have we touched, I guess, in that sense of like them teaching themselves and them teaching each other within the group of the sort of the older women teaching the younger women. Um, but yeah, I guess for me personally, I guess having grown up in the suburbs, what I, um, kind of felt connected to was that question of, of um, 
it's maybe self pedagogy or, or like locating a self and locating a culture within the abyss, I suppose. And so, and, and whether, and pedagogy feels like a, a very serious word for something when you're just like, you know, scrounging around on the radio for songs that you like or something like that, or, you know, that sort of thing. And so it, but I suppose it is that, you know, and, and it's, it's about an encounter and it's about chance as well. And, um, I don't know. I mean, it, it's like, I did, I didn't feel, I could uh, understand or comment on the type of dance that they did, I guess, or, you know, that sort of thing. Like I can understand it as a form of urban dance and they're using lots of different styles, but then I'd be, you know, partially me would just be interested in like where they gathered and learned those styles from and how they wanted to mix them together and whether, where those knowledge comes from. But then it's not my place to know that as well, I guess. And the piece kind of leaves that at a distance and that's fine, you know, that's the way it is because it's their choice to do that, I guess. Um, so I guess, yeah, for me, the pedagogical aspect was thinking about those questions of arriving at something at yourself while also kind of recognizing their own agency within that and that they can maintain that space or well, but the precarity of it, I guess, it ultimately becomes part of the point too, that they've, they've, they've gotten the space and but then they'll move to another one, I guess. And then, then they might keep moving. I mean, it's that question, I guess, always of like volunteer led organizations of how long people can commit to them. And I guess, so, you know, this idea that the next generation can keep going as well. Mm. Mm. Which, um, sorry. sorry. Yeah, go ahead. It left me with, kind of mixed feelings about, um, particularly when I read the contextual essay, that they've never been funded. They, mm. they, they've kind of done all of this through their own kind of force of will somehow and the help of their parents and so on. But largely it's, they've invented this with, with no official support. And, and part of me thought that's unfair. And part of me thought that's the point um, that it's, it's at which um, brings with it a kind of precariousness and absolute uncertainty and the fact that um, um, they have done it the hard way. And at the risk of suggesting that's a good thing in itself, I, I wonder whether the, the fact that there wasn't the municipal dance space built just like the basketball court or the, or the, or the football um, uh, pitch, whether that's actually a, whether that's productive, whether that's the friction that produces this. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good question of like, obviously they don't need official recognition to get on with it because they're getting on in with it anyway. You know, I mean, I guess that was to me part of the interesting thing about raising this idea of the lack of discourse because it's obviously happening. It's just, you know, it's not like we need to, or I need to articulate it for it to happen. It, you know, it, it's already happening anyway. And, um, and yeah, maybe the itineracy and the flexibility and the determination of it is the point and that they make their own infrastructure that doesn't rely on official state infrastructure or parental infrastructure or any of that sort of stuff, you know? I mean, yeah, there's, there's a precariousness, but yeah, I suppose maybe that would be another aspect of, of this claiming in some sense and claiming the, the the colors is that it's it's their precarity to to work with if as they see fit mm. Mm. yeah i think that de definitely speaks to another question we have from an anonymous attendee um about so the question is would the production of space activate the process of becoming for the bodies in the space so i guess yeah, how, how, how it kind of works reflexively maybe, um, rather than just intervening in the kind of, I, I'm, rather than intervening in the sort of um, municipality, how, how that then intervenes in the, in the selves or the, the bodies who are participating in that way. That makes sense. I mean, I think I think the video itself kind of answers that in a really particular way, in the sense that um, 
I guess to describe for those who haven't seen the video, I mean, when they do the dance, it's like it's the point when they're all quite focused. It's the point when some of them feel a bit more loose. They're smiling. There's people watching who are trying to kind of imitate them. And it, so it feels like that seems like a point of activation for them. Absolutely. And, I, and not in any abstract sense, like in a very real sense, I suppose, that they, they do seem like they're emboldened and and happy, you know, that they're, that they're doing this thing. And, and that seems to be the main, and that it's infectious almost, that there's other people kind of watching and that, and I suppose that was an interesting, again, the implication of the, the glasses as an exploded architecture is like the glass is the, the main audience for this as well. So in some sense, it's like implicating the whole, all the buildings as their audience. And, and so, yeah, there seemed to be a sort of necessary porosity to it too, in the sense of like that, if they can be happy in that space, then other people will see that. And then it, yeah, can activate other, I mean, I guess I'm wary of, it sounding kind of like an abstraction in terms of activating bodies in space, but it is, I guess it is that, but I, I want to kind of ground it in their emotional and, and you know, direct responses, I think mm -hmm. you can see anyway, as far as I can understand, I can't, you know. Um, so yeah, and, and that seems to potentially, you know, you, you know, we could project that it inspires other people to use space in that way. And I think that seems to be the implicit part of this pedagogical aspect is that is the sort of inspirational element of it. Mm -hmm. But that also sounds like kind of overly optimistic as well somehow. But yeah, I think we're kind of locating a sort of dual aspect to that, you know, and that it's, yeah, it can be precious, but that seems to be a sort of determination that's part of it as well. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And, and in a way, that perhaps thinking back to the form of the film, if I'm right, um, the, the, uh, we could see the, the performance as being the focal point of the work, but in fact, it's not the conclusion of the work. Firstly, it's looped as shown as an installation, but second, there's a good three, four minutes of equally um, prosaic kind of meandering activity after the, the dance. So it's certainly not the climax, it's certainly not the grand finale. Life somehow yeah, kind of marker of again afterwards, yeah. doesn't it? Um, and uh, the young women go and hang out by an underpass and a car slowly drives by and we hear the birds again. And then of course the video would loop back. But, but that one seems to play into the kind of attentiveness that, that the work um, is both a, a product of and it fosters perhaps in the viewer, but also it could be read as a suggestion that actually the idea of the performance isn't necessarily the point. It's one of the points, but it's not the point. Mm. And I, I wonder then, Chris, about this question, which is one that I've kind of asked myself, um, which is, in a sense, what is in purple? Where, where is the work? Is the work the film? Or is the work the event that the film in some way documents? Or is the event, whether it's the dance or whether it's the moving the glass around, or whether it's the process, the three years that Villain spent, or whether actually it's, it reaches even further back and it's the story of mixed dance, the, the, the dance group. And well, um, it's more of a comment than a question. <laughs> um, uh, I suppose it's I, I'm e, all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I wonder. I wonder whether it's very deliberately all of those things without yeah. being one well, of those singular. I mean, I started to think of the dance as the carrying of the glass, and you know, there's the quiet part of the dance, and there's the loud part of the dance. You know, so yeah. there's them carrying the glass, and then there's them kicking their legs out about a bit more in, in a more kind of mm. uh, gridded formation. So it, it's, yeah, the whole thing is the dance. 
but then there's all the other stuff around it and like as you know, you know as you say it's like the city itself the mixed dancers within that you know there's there's a good 40 years that have gone into all that i suppose mm -hmm. so, um uh, and i think you know and here we are talking about it as well you know so i think it's um the video enables that mobility of the uh thinking about the precarity of it i suppose in some sense you know so um but i think that openness of the the camera and the editing and that kind of stuff enables that to reflect the infrastructure the history the events you know that then it can sort of mirror it and carry it onward so yeah i think it, it is all of the above <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. So, um, someone in the audience also asked um, mm -hmm. about the role of the girls in the in the film being elusive, and and in relation to the precarity you were just discussing, what does it tell us about the construction of identity that those roles are kind of elusive? Maybe there's something to be said there about identity. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, for me, sort of implicit in this learning of of dance and that sort of thing is this question of identity of like what you like what you want to do how you, you see yourself reflected in others um i mean that it the group itself um seems to have a mixture of backgrounds but that it seems more like they but the uniforms as well as like them asserting a common identity with each other so um but yeah i think again yeah it, it, the metaphor of the reflection and the glass and all of the spatial precarity, I think does carry to those questions of identity and identity formation as well, of that um, it can go lots of directions all at once, I suppose. But, um, and it can dissipate just as quickly, I suppose, in terms of what you pay attention to and uh, I don't know, do, I suppose, I don't know. Well, we're coming up to, um, we're almost coming up to an hour. Um, I wonder if there are any more questions anyone wants to get in before we before we wrap it up. Um, or Graham, if you had anything else to um, add to that. Otherwise, I'll just give people a few seconds to <laughs> put their hands up. Yeah. Mm. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chris for your essay and for joining us to have this discussion. Thank and thanks so much Graham for, um, for your excellent hosting and to all of you for your questions. These are all, yeah, all really interesting, a very kind of well-connected well discussion. Um, yeah, this will, um, we've got some, some people in the, in the audience that thanking everyone. High fives, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wish we could all see each other, but anyway. Um, yeah, our next art school event will be this Thursday. Um, well, it's still the week of the showcase at, so Thursday at six, um, where we'll be talking about Elizabeth Catlett's sculpture, Students Aspire. Um, otherwise, I will say, yeah, thank you very much everyone for joining us um, and hopefully see you at the next one. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye. Bye, thanks, Chris. Thank you.